there are many stories about the beginning. There are as many creation stories in this world as there are nations. In the details, they may differ, but on the basics, they agree. In the beginning was the Creator, Great Spirit, God, the pre-existing one, and the Creator brought forth the physical universe, the stars and planets, this earth, our mother, and all the spectrum of creation with whom we share this gift of life. The beginning for the first peoples was in our mother, was in this broad and varied land of forest, plain, and mountain, a land by turns flowing with living waters or white with drifting snow. The Creator placed all of us in this land, each creature, each people, in its own place in the great circle of life. And the Creator bid us live in this land in harmony with our mother and with all the creatures of the circle. Bid us keep the circle strong, and we did. We, the first peoples, were free and sovereign nation in the land. The Beothuk, Mi'kmaq, Inu, Cree, Iroquois, Anisnabi, Blackfoot, Denny, Kipsan, Haida, Niska, Inuit, and many others. Sometimes we fought over boundaries, but mostly we lived in peace. Sometimes the game was scarce, but mostly we found what we needed to live and prosper in this great garden. We cared for the land. We took only what we needed. We gave back. We gave thanks to our Creator, to our Mother the Earth, to our sisters and brothers of the land, the trees, grasses, fish, birds, and animals, even the very stones, and to our grandfathers and grandmothers whose spirit walked with us, to all with whom we danced in the circle of life, all my relations. But there came into this land other nations from across the waters to the east, nations of men. At first they were all men, men under orders from powerful rulers across the sea. We greeted these men and welcomed them. We guided them in the land and traded with them. We fed them and sheltered them for they did not know the ways of the land. Some of them we married and bore their children so that their blood mingled with ours. But their ways were not our ways, for their leaders were harsh men, bent on exploration, expansion, conquest. Their eyes were cold, their weapons hard, and their numbers kept increasing until they were like a scourge upon the land. They killed the buffalo, the beaver, the passenger pigeon. They cut down the trees, and we knew hunger and disease, and many of our people fell, all my relations. Then the Europeans began to push us even harder, bargaining for the land, bargaining for our mother, making treaties as if anyone could ever own the earth. And even those hard bargains and poor treaties they broke, their word was not their bond, though it lay upon the printed page in which they claimed to put such store. Not all were alike. Among those who came to us from across the sea, there were some who did not come with weapons, who did not come with rum. They came in the name of Jesus, they brought to us the story and promise of redemption, a balm for our wounded hearts. Many there were among us who received him, for his yoke was gentle and his burden light. His ways were the ways of the Creator we loved. We saw that he came to fulfill the old ways, not to abolish them. For us this Jesus came as a new spring from whom we could drink again the living waters all my relations. We accepted Jesus, but we got the church. 
We fell under the sway of a church who felt its faith and culture favored by God, who believed its way of walking with Jesus was the only way acceptable to God. The church people saw us sick and dying and poor in spirit, and they told us that salvation lay in their ways, their language, their culture, their church, and they made schools for us. As children, they took us from home, from mothers and fathers, from our land, and they put us in these schools to learn their harsh and abusive ways and to forget our own sweet walk. Today, I carry the pain of that school. We were not allowed to speak our language. When we were caught to, we were speaking our language, we were stuck like this. You know, those shoulders, they had the metal edges. I've seen the things that took place in that school, the abuse. I was abused myself. I was trapped behind the legs for running away. I was punished for speaking my own language, and I was made fun of for speaking that language. Immediately upon arriving in the school, I was told that I could not speak my language, and I was told in English. And I guess I asked back, I don't understand you, in native, and I was immediately beaten. And so many of us, all my relations, we believed what we were told. We came to despise our languages, our spiritual pathways, our grandfathers and grandmothers, even the color of our skin, and we stumbled from those schools even more lost, even more desolate, no longer at home with our people, existing only around the edges of the white world, no home, even in the church. The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but many of us had nowhere on this green earth to call home. We had lost our mother. And many ran away into the bottle, into alcohol and drug abuse, we let out our confusion, our self-hatred, by beating one another, abusing one another. All too many among us took their own lives. When the sexual abuse was discovered and everybody cried out and some people were happy and a lot of people were sad, when those people came forward and admitted the sexual abuse, they didn't have any mechanism for the healing process after they divulged all this information and everybody knew that they had been abused in one way or another. There was nothing for them after that and they were basically left out in the open and a lot of them felt ashamed and there were some cases of suicide. I couldn't step forward when all my friends were out there. I guess I was just too afraid. Uh, two of them are dead already. One's total alcoholic, drug abuse. And I know why. I don't remember, you know, talking to anybody or even my best friends, you know. Um, but now my, a lot of my friends have died off because of suicide and or whatever, accidental deaths. And that's a hard pill to swallow. The straight, proud plant that had been our nations had died, and winter was upon our souls. All my relations weep for the children, but there were others among us who lay buried like the seed of our people in the dark haven of Mother Earth, like the mustard seed of which Jesus spoke. Elders who still clung to the knowledge of our ways, mothers and fathers who fought for their children, fierce youth who would not accept defeat, survivors of the school who now understood the white society were learning how to challenge it, church people too who knew that Jesus loves us for who we are, that our ways were not wrong but a gift from the Creator, people whose faith had made them well. 
I felt something in here when I started hearing those big drums. I, it just did something to me. I'm not quite sure what, but I felt like I had come home. You see, I'm, I'm very grateful to my grandparents and the way they raised me, especially to my grandfather, who raised me to hunt, to fish, to trap, and, and in a sense also raised me to be a warrior for my people, to, to stand up to speak my mind when, when I need to speak my mind. And when I grow weak, to go to the cold waters, to, to go to our sweat lodges, to use our pipes, to pray, to offer ourselves to suffer. And our mother cradled these seeds of my people through this hard winter, kept them cradled in her bosom while winter storms raged around them kept them safe until the great medicine wheel of life should roll around again to a new season. For all winters have an end, and so the time of fall, of new life, of resurrection has come, is here. From the scarred earth are now emerging the green shoots of a culture reborn, a spirit reborn, a people reborn. The shoots are yet small, they are still fragile, but they are everywhere, appearing across the land, in the tiny lost communities and the great groaning cities. The spring wind of the spirit is blowing among them, among the healing circles, the sweat lodges, sun dances, potlatches, the powwows. We will grow like the mustard seed, and we will make green again this earth, our mother, all my relations. In my church, the Anglican Church of Canada, the first water for the seeds, the first sign of spring warmth for my people, came in the 1960s with the closing of the residential schools and the presenting of the Henry Report at the 1969 General Synod. The church is a conservative creature, large and unwieldy, but slowly it began to change direction. It began to support the First Nations in their political struggle for the honoring of our treaty and land rights, for our right to self-determination and for respect for Mother Earth across the land. The first seed among our people to spring up within the church was a lonely one. Ernie Willey, who they hired to help us find our voice and place within the Anglican church structure. And lo and behold, I was a token Indian. Somehow, the prevailing attitude was that we were kind of cute and maybe even cuddly for all I know. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of good to have us in the parade of, of clergy and so on. There followed a council of First Nations Anglicans appointed by the primate to carry this work further, to water the soil, to nurture the new seeds. But we were just new sprouts ourselves. Many times we were afraid as we poked our heads above the earth and into the light of day. Sometimes the spring seemed to stop its advance. The wind blew cold again. There were dry spells. Sometimes there was even snow. It becomes difficult to sort the message of love and of concern and of sharing and caring and all that to the message of the almighty dollar that will keep my edifice up and my bureaucracy up. And pardon the expression, but the hell with the people. And then it led me to say things like, If I was talking to Jesus directly today, I would say, sir, you may have to come and do it all over again. They missed the point. But the medicine wheel turns, and to everything there is a season. And so we grew, and new suits joined us, all my relations. Another indication of what it was like to be needed was uh, when the recreation committee decided to have a, a competition to design a crest and a model, I guess, for the, for 
Walpole Island. And my brother drew uh, a picture, and it was the sh shape of a shield. And in the center of the shield was a bottle, and inside the bottle was an Indian. And on top, he put Walpole Island Recreation. And that was his image of, of Walpole Island. Um, you know, being trapped inside that bottle and, in a sense, being trapped on reserve. And, and I felt the same way. All through school, um, the questions in history classes about, uh, you know, about your native background tell us about that. And I started to realize I don't know anything about my native background. I've uh, grew up assimilated in that non-native community, attended the church, and and all that education and community didn't teach me who I was as a Native person. When I was turned 19, I left the church. I, I could say that Christ and Jesus has always been a, uh, a personal uh, companion in my journey. I've never felt him away from me. Never, never once did I feel that he was away from me. It was myself that went away from him and tried to ignore him but I, he never left me. And from across the country we gathered in the first Anglican Native Convocation. For the first time in a long time, we celebrated our identity, Aboriginal and Anglican, and shared the dream of a new life for our people. We embraced the painful but necessary work of healing ourselves I have never in my life, as long as I've been with the church, ever, ever saw so many Native people congregated together and bringing their concerns. I have never, ever saw so many um, of our own Native men that went into the priesthood at that meeting. I was, uh, I was amazed, I was thrilled, I was... I think I was just taken aback. We gathered again and dragged a reluctant church into the process of looking at the residential school issue. With a harvester belt this thick and that wide, they strapped me in my bare bottom for every time they caught me speaking my language. There was a chair right in the middle, in the front of the room, and one by one, we came to that chair to sit down and had our hair cut off. I looked down and I saw all that black hair all around the chair. There were other girls that were ahead of me. There was a lot of us that had long black hair. Now I think that must have been the beginning of the efforts of the residential school to cut me off from my Indianness. The sexual abuse is not over. It happened in the past. It's still happening in our own homes. At last, from the primate, came words many had been waiting to hear. I am sorry. More than I can say. That we were part of a system which took you and your children from home and family. I am sorry more than I can say that we tried to remake you in our image. I am sorry more than I can say that in our schools so many were abused, 
physically, sexually, culturally, and emotionally. All these have nourished our rebirth, have strengthened our roots, have spread new seed to grow across the land, have brought healing to the damaged soil of our land and history, have slowly allowed us to turn our face towards the sun again. When I look at my land, and I'm back there now, the very blood of my ancestors are in and amongst my land and my waters. They are the very birds of the air, the fishes in the sea and so on, because life, do we not really believe that, that life is eternal? In some ways, I'm a person who lives in two worlds and is always sort of caught in the middle and doesn't quite belong here, doesn't quite belong there. Um, that seems to be the sort of the story of my life. I'm proud of who I am, proud to teach that to my son so he'll be proud of who he is, and not ever to be made to feel that he should be ashamed of who he is a new sense of confidence of who, who I am, a new sense of confidence of who I am as part of this church. And now, the healing, the nurturing of our rebirth has begun to sow signs of bearing fruit. The tiny buds that may become the first flowers have begun to appear. We have begun to claim again the meaning of the two-row wampum that the people of the Iroquois Confederacy first presented to the English more than 300 years ago. You have been brought here for the purpose and the will of God. The native community has been exactly what we have been in the colonial church all of these years because we have been a seed planted deep in the earth. It was a really, it's a difficult a, a difficult moment to describe because there was a real strong sense of God's presence in the room. We went around in a circle and each person spoke to the question, you know, is this, is this direction that we, we should be moving, uh, forming, you know, a separate entity of some sort. And when the final person spoke and we realized that there was total consensus, I mean, there was a a strong silence in the room. I mean, you could just, you could feel it, and, and you could really feel that this was a really sacred space and sacred time. We made our commitment to spiritual renewal and to a new relationship with the Anglican Church of Canada, to an autonomous, truly Anglican Indigenous Church that will stand side by side with the Anglican Church of Canada. We are growing and we are going to stand beside our white sisters and brothers as equal partners in a community with one another, but with our own integrity, with our own identity. When we did the covenant in uh, Winnipeg, I felt there was a strong uh, spirit that was, that was leading us, and at times it was pushing us to, uh, to put in words uh, what our feelings were in regards to a church. It's like two people in a bad marriage. They have to go their ways to become whole people again. And uh, uh, it's going to be hurtful. It's unavoidable. Uh, but I think uh, once we uh, recognize who we are as Indian people within the context of the Anglican Communion, I think we'll be a stronger a church overall. I don't really see it as a separation or a pulling away. The covenant to me, I guess, is a maturity of people, of their commitment and convictions as, a, as an Anglican, as a Christian. This wasn't just a vision that was for that group that were gathered in Winnipeg, but that the vision is already in the communities. And that NUC across the country, uh, a movement all across the country in 
sort of in, in the secular world, in secular world, where Native communities are moving more and more towards self-determination. The word is humility, and humility uh, has, its root, has its roots in the Latin word humus, of the earth. So that's what, that's what goes through all of our, our uh, traditions, our, our, uh, our spiritual leaders practice humility first, rather than, you know, come to me, I know it all, I'll show it to you. That's a mistake. People, people should make that mistake. But let us feel fully part of the church. We have much to offer, much to learn. There's sharing on both sides of our church community and family. We are now in the time of the seventh fire, as prophesied in the Anishinaabe tradition, a time when a remnant of my people will be reborn. It is happening. First peoples within the Anglican Church are part of it too. We invite the white church to join us. The Creator has placed before all of us two choices, life, harmony in the spirit, respect and love for one another, and for all living things, or death, greed, oppression of one another, destruction of Mother Earth. Therefore, let us choose life. <laughs>